Hey there, folks. Welcome to another edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Today in the program, I have Bob Gefeller, the executive director of the Childers Institute for Pediatric Trauma. Uh, before Bob was the executive director there, he was actually a high-level executive in Nabisco, uh, Coca-Cola, as well as Lowe's Home Improvement. Uh, but in one day, in a tragic incident, Bob's whole life changed where his uh, son died um, during a football game because of trauma. And ever since then, Bob has dedicated his life to the awareness, the prevention, and care for pediatric trauma. And that's what led him to the Children's Institute. Um, Bob is just an amazing man, and I feel very lucky to sit down and talk to him. And I must thank Jackie. A big thank you to Jackie. She's the one that helped uh, put me and Bob together. Um, this is one of three interviews that Jackie lined up for me, and Bob was one of the first, so it's it's a good one. I highly recommend if you have kids to listen to this episode. It's very deep and very emotional, and it's definitely thought-provoking. Um, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things uh, going on in my life, and I, I don't have kids, and I can only imagine how a parent... Um, has to deal with the worry of you know pediatric trauma, not only the prevention awareness, but also the care after the incident. So we cover a lot of ground in this in, in this, this podcast, and I also want to thank Kara. Uh, we cover, like I said, we cover a lot of ground and it takes up a lot of time. And we actually made a uh, Bob late for his next appointment, but Kara was very understanding. So I want to let her know that I'm very thankful for that because we did, we really got it in. We got a good podcast for you guys today, and I. And, very proud to bring it to you today. But also, I'm very proud to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by Tree Monstrous Comedy Wednesday. Uh, former Stranger in a Sutherland guest Nick Alexander presents to you a comedy show at Tremont Music Hall every Wednesday, at least until they close in December. Um, Nick is doing a lot of great things. He's bringing in national touring acts as well as some of the best local talent today. So if you want to see some good stand-up in the air and some nationally known comedians, I highly recommend that you come out to Tree Monsters Comedy Wednesdays. For more information, make sure you log on to TremontMusicHall.com. If you want to know more about me and follow me, what I'm going on, make sure you follow me on social media. I am available on Twitter at Manscout Manning and on Instagram at Manscout Manning. If you have a question about the podcast, make sure you email me at jake at sslshow.com. Or if you want to book me for an upcoming rest event, make sure you email me at manscoutmanning at yahoo.com. Anyways, let's jump into this wonder, wonderful interview with Bob Gefeller from the Childers Institute for Pediatric Trauma here on Stranger in a Southern Land. I'm sitting here with Bob Gefeller, uh, executive director of the Childers Institute for Pediatric Trauma. Yep. Uh, you know, you know. Thank you for very much, sir, for sitting down today. Thank you know, you. I know you probably have a busy uh, schedule today, but uh, you know, I, I'm going to do something with you that I don't normally do with people that come on my podcast. I'm going to tell you my my evil secret why okay. I started this. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to put a lot of responsibility uh -oh. on <laughs> is right. is that. My goal with this is talk to successful people okay. and figure out how they did it and why they're successful. Because um, obviously I haven't figured it out. So I'm hopefully... You're on the right track. Yeah, well, hope, hopefully hopefully through a conversation I can steal some things that you do and steal some of your contacts okay. and we get from there. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> but, good. But, but, uh, but anyways, Bob, let's talk a little bit about your background, where'd you camp come from and sure. you know, you know, grew up and all that sure, stuff. Sure, sure. So, so I'm, I'm also a transplant to North okay. Carolina. All right. Uh, I was born in New York. Oh, okay. Uh, a town called Mount Vernon, which when I say Mount Vernon, people are like, what the hell? Where's that? I thought Mount Vernon was somewhere else. So that, that is next to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And uh, raised there for a number of years. Then I moved to Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. And then from there, I went off to college in Pennsylvania, went back to New York City, lived in New York City for a while, met my wife in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I was working for a company called Nabisco. You're pretty young. You might not know Nabisco, but that was the National Biscuit Company. I was so going to say, the, the cookies. You got and, it, Oreos. Yeah, yeah yes. there you go. Chips Ahoy, Nutter Butter. Yeah. And uh, R.J. Reynolds bought Nabisco back in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I was with Nabisco, and they moved us to North Carolina, to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, mm -hmm. which is where I live now, and uh, have lived there, I'd say, on and off for the last 25 or so years. Okay. So so when, when you grew up, like, uh, 
you know, what your dad, what your mom do? Yeah, like, sure. It seemed like there's a little bit of moving around there. Yeah, a little bit, not that much, not that much. It was moving. My my dad um, is still a doctor. He's 83 okay. years old. Uh, he's an obstetrician and gynecologist. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, people, <laughs> when I was a kid, people would ask me, "Well, what does that mean?" And I'd say, "Well, he operates on ladies and delivers babies." <laughs> but that's what he's done for a long time. Yeah. And actually, right now, he gave up his practice, uh, and he still teaches at UConn Med School. Okay. Uh, my mom was a teacher mm-hmm. and a home, you know, a homemaker. She she was kind of she stayed home when we were uh, probably about high school age. But I have two siblings. One is a sister older than me by two years, and then I have a brother a decade younger. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my my parents now live in Hartford and ended up in Hartford because my dad merged his practice. He was a solo practitioner, and as an OBGYN, you're on call all the time because you don't know when a baby's coming. Yeah. And uh, he was getting very tired. And so he merged his practice with a couple other docs. That mm-hmm. moved us from New York to Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And uh, my sister now is a pediatrician up in Boston, and my brother is a lawyer in uh, Hartford. So he lives about 10 minutes from my parents, which is good because they're in their 80s, okay. 83 and 80. All right. They all seem to be doing quite well for yeah, themselves. Yeah, they're doing you know? very well. Yeah, they're healthy, and, and they've had a good life. They've had a very good life. Their kids are all up and around. Their grandparents uh, nine times over. Okay. So they're blessed. Well, that's that. That's that's amazing. <laughs> what, what do you think is like the hallmark of that? You know, like you know, the, it doesn't seem like there's a black sheep in the family. So obviously, your parents yeah, got it right. What was some of yeah. those some values they probably instilled in them? Wow. Like, well, my I, it's interesting because things pass multi generationally. Like for instance, I'm a junior, mm-hmm. and my my oldest son is a third. Mm-hmm. So Robert John Gefeller the third. So um, my background is Italian and Swiss. Catholic. So there's a lot of tradition in the family, let's put it that way, whether it's holiday or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of get in in line. Yeah, you got it right. You you follow in line here, you know, just follow (laughs) this. Now, the line's gotten a little bit more zigzag over the years, but um, I'd say probably my parents instilled uh, definitely a great sense of family Mm -hmm. um, and how important family is. And that's played a pretty big role for my wife and I because of, uh, you know, we having lost a child along the way. Um, and I would say, uh, perseverance is very important. Courage is very important. Um, and my dad had a, has still a famous saying that, that, uh, we've carried multi-generationally, which is tonight, tonight, and every night. And I would say to my dad, what the heck are you saying to me years ago? when he'd say that, he said, well, he went to Jesuit school. So if you know, okay. so that's a very disciplined Catholic education. And mm-hmm. he was in the day when the teachers could use the old whack on the wrist. Mm-hmm. And so his, his Jesuit uh, priest teachers would say, Robert, tonight, tonight, and every night, meaning study. Mm-hmm. <laughs> study to do well. Yeah. And so anyway, those are some of the, the qualities. But yeah, our, our family's very tight. They've been definitely blessed. And, uh, and they're just fun to be with now. Because the other thing about my parents, and again, I don't know if your parents are alive or with you or not, but one of the things that my parents have always known how to do, which I'm not as good at, is relax. Because when they relax, they really slow down. And I think that's why they're so healthy in their 80s. I guarantee you they'll be in their 90s. Because mm-hmm. they know when to just kind of chill. Yeah. When they when their body's had enough or their mind has had enough. Well, my, my dad's definitely like that. Is that yeah, great? My, my, I, great like, I have vivid memories of my dad getting in sweatpants, and it's even to this day. <laughs> On a Sunday, he's right, in sweatpants right? for sure. It's my mom that gets a little is bit right? hyper yeah. about I'm, things. We're, we're kind of the same. Yeah, we're yeah. My mom is very high strung. Uh-huh. You know, uh-huh. I definitely yeah. get my strength in, in talking to people, uh, good or bad. <laughs> I get, Ditto. I get Ditto. that from my mom. Right? My dad very much crossword puzzles, sweatpants. Right. A lot of books, my dad, too. A lot of books. Yeah. When it's downtime, it's reading time. My dad lo- reads a lot on the internet. Does he really? Yeah. Wow. I don't know if it's good or good or bad information, yeah, 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 but he yeah. spends a lot of time in there. <laughs> Mine have not become that technology savvy. They're still in the old hardbacks, you know, that they kind of yeah. read through. Well, it's funny. Yeah. Is my mom is a media specialist. She was in charge oh, of wiring my entire high school up with oh, internet in the very early 90s. And um, she's very, you know, tech savvy. Yeah. But she reads books hard books where my dad 
is always on the internet. So it's kind of funny. I think it's because of the sense that she wants she wants to hold something all day where she's reading in front of a screen all day long. So I think that's kind of the thing. But but you talked a lot about education. When it came time for you to go to college, where'd you want to go and would you want to study? Yeah, sure. So um uh, well, I played sports. You're an athlete. Okay, I played we, sports we, yeah, all through, yeah, all through, uh, all through high school. Um, uh, played football, played basketball, and played lacrosse, which in the Northeast was a big game. Now it's I a, hear a it's big a big deal. Game. Yeah, yeah I've, very, I've interviewed the Charlotte Hounds, and it seems like that go. upper yeah. New York. That's like yeah. a very big sport. And so when I was coming through, lacrosse um, was played probably mainly Northeast. Kind of came down into Maryland and, mm-hmm. and even Carolina. And obviously UNC still has a great team. But I wanted to play lacrosse in college, mm-hmm. so I went to a Division three school called Franklin and Marshall College. It would be like going to Elon okay. equivalent around here or mm-hmm. a Davidson equivalent around here. Small, mm-hmm. two thousand students. Yeah, Division three. So I, I I chose that school because I had the opportunity to play lacrosse, get a good education. It's a really good school. Um, and it was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which if you know much about Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I it's do. the I've Amish actually re- country. I've wrestled there a couple well, there of times go. before. So. so it was like nothing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you studied, you had, you played your sports, and of course you had some social going on. And so uh, that's where I went to school. I was an economics major. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I came out of there and I knew I wanted to go into sales. Because okay. my personality is such that I'm kind of a big extrovert, and I wanted to get out there and see if I could do it. So, well, what is it about I, sales that's so much attract? Because I, I like yeah. sales, and I like the interaction with people. Yeah. I like selling a good product. Yeah, selling a bad product is not as fun, but selling a good product is very fun. Yes, and yes. satisfying. It seems like when you give that person something that you know they're going to like and enjoy yeah. and take some value out yeah. of. Yeah, you're absolutely right, dead on right, and that, that's actually where I wanted it to go because I wanted to sell a product. I was very interested in actually being able to sell and transact a physical product as opposed to a financial service or an insurance service or something like that, which Mm -hmm. for my brain was too abstract. So I wanted to get into sales of products. So I I ended up going to work for a food broker that sold, they they quote, repped products. They had lines that they repped. Mm -hmm. And um, some are not here anymore. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) Uh, one was a Mexican brand named Tio Sancho, um, mm-hmm. which was like tortillas and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Shasta Soda. You ever heard of Shasta yes, Soda? Yes, yeah, I it's have. Still kicking yeah, around. I'm, I'm aware. Yep, sold Shasta. Tootsie Roll was probably the marquee. Mm-hmm. And then Progresso Soup, which is still around the still grocery around. store. Yeah, yeah, big Northeast brand. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I did. I started selling for Feroli, Feroli Foods. They're still around, hard mm-hmm. to believe, in the Bronx. I okay. actually went back and had a had a had a. a um, uh, route in the Bronx, lived with my grandparents, moved back to, with my grandparents in Mount Vernon, New York, mm-hmm. and then did that for a while and then went back to grad school. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, why, why, oh, why go back to grad school? What was it? What were you looking for? Well, in my world at that time, so this is, your, this is the mid eighties. Okay. Okay. And in the world of marketing and sales in the mid eighties, you, there were kind of two tracks. You had a sales track and then you had what was called a, a product management track. Um, so the sales track was exactly doing what I was doing, calling on accounts, building, and that's when Walmart was starting to roll. Some mm. of the price clubs were starting to roll. Okay. So if you wanted to stay in sales, you were going to start calling on the Kroger's of the world, the Albertsons of the world, the Walmarts, the Costco's, the CVS's. Mm-hmm. But if you wanted to kind of get behind the product, how do you make the product? How do you make the packaging of the product? What's the strategy? Why am I selling this program? Who cooked this thing up? Mm-hmm. You kind of move. You had to move into product management, and at, at that time, in order to move into product management, that brought you back into a headquarters, mm-hmm. and most of the time, you had to have a master's to break into that. Okay. And so I went back to New York University in Manhattan to get my my MBA in marketing. Mm-hmm. And so I did that in the mid '80s, and I switched from working for Nabisco to going to work for—I'm sorry—from working for Feroli Foods to going to work for Colgate Palmolive. So toothpaste, yeah. shaving cream back then, and of course all the Palmolive stuff, detergents, dish liquids. Mm-hmm. And so I started my career, which is really where I spent a lot of my time, more in marketing in what's called brand management or product management. Okay, uh, the, you know that I. I I was a minor in marketing. There you I, go. I, I, I grasped. Well, you got it. I grasped some of those concepts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I have to market myself for pro wrestling and everything else that I do. But uh, you know, what were the things that attracted you to that? Like you said, you had two tracks, but you yeah. could have picked the other. Yeah. Because it's just the, the you know. 
Well, I think what attracted to me was as a sales rep, like for example, so when I had, when I had my little rep job, I had my car, I had all my stuff in the trunk. Mm -hmm. I had my route, I had my broom Mm -hmm. and I had my orders, you know, go, this is the program for this month and you'd go sell it. And that, you know, my personality was, boom, I'm, that's no problem. I, I can do that. Walk in the store is like, hey, put our products Absolutely. in the Absolutely. You got it. And, right. and so a lot of mom and pop places, you can do that. It, it's not like, like I said, the big expansions right. and stuff like that. But I was always inquisitive on the why. Why mm-hmm. am I being told to do that? Why did Progresso Soup just come out with this whole new line of products? Mm-hmm. Why does the packaging look that terrible or that good? Yeah. And in order to kind of get behind it, um, that's what led me to marketing, which was more kind of at the source. You were developing uh, the formulas for the product, the packaging for the product, the promotions for the product, the selling strategy for the product. Um, and then, of course, you had to execute because a good plan is a terrible plan if it doesn't get executed. Mm-hmm. And so that was really what was driving me. And it, and it actually pushed me even to marketing research, which, you know, is really core right now. You hear about consumer insights, understanding yep. your customer. Back then, it was marketing research. And so actually, when I was at NYU, I had a job at a company called Matthew Bender, <clears throat> which uh, is a strange name, but they were a publisher of legal textbooks. And they had an internship in their research group. And I took it because I didn't understand what research was. So I was getting my master's while I was working in research, and the whole thing just kind of came together. Well, you said uh, you just brought up something interesting. You said I didn't understand it, so I want to know more about it. Yeah. What? what mm-hmm. You know, most people don't think that way. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> if I don't know it, I won't need to know it. You know, that's yeah. kind of the thing. What made you want to do that? Well, I guess growing up, I had a lot of little businesses going on as a, in high school and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was always interested in. Like I had a lawn mowing business, right? And so I was always interested in why did this person, the Kramers, want their lawn cut one way, whereas uh, the Morgan Bessers wanted their lawn cut a different way. I don't. So I was always intrigued on why, why, why. You're trying more inquisitive. To, yeah, I want I want to dig I, deeper I, into yeah. it. And so it was maybe by that time it was just a learned curiosity. Mm-hmm. And I, I really think that as I was thinking about my life, because I was single, I was mm-hmm. in New York. Um, that must have been amazing. That was fun. A lot Especially, of fun. Again, met my hey, wife. Absolute yeah. blast. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know, as we all think about it, I was in my mid twenties. I was trying to figure out well, what's this, what's this career thing all about, mm-hmm. and and do I want to be in a sales career because I could kind of see where that was going, or do I want to be in a marketing career because what would happen at Feroli Foods, as an example, once a month you'd have a sales meeting, right? They still have, everybody has them today. Uh, RCR Racing has them, you know. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen there is all the reps would be in the room, and then all the marketing guys from Progresso, Tootsie Roll, would show up at the front of the room, and they'd be pitching their programs to you. And I always remember sitting in the room thinking, now, why, why is he telling me to do this? I would be doing that. <laughs> or, you know, oh, I get that piece of research. That's something I can use as I go talk to my store managers about why in mm-hmm. the fall, big soup season, I need to be able to put this display up next to the beer, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so I guess maybe that's what fostered it. Okay, just a sense of curiosity, yeah. just figuring it out. You yeah, know I think so, yeah. Okay. Definitely. All right, so from, like you said, you said that you – you were up in New York there for a while, and yeah. then you ended up Nabisco and heading down south. Yes. And that's yes. got to be a big jump for somebody, a Northeasterner. Yeah. To, to especially, and when did you come down here? So I, I came to North Carolina in 1988. Okay. The end so of 1980, a long time ago. Probably a big, big, big difference. Jump. Yes. Yeah, big in that jump. Moment of time. Like yeah, now, I, maybe yeah. a little bit softer no, landing. Oh, yeah, much softer landing. But, right, uh, right. Not, the 88 might it probably be <laughs> pretty rough. Pretty well, rough. I can tell you what what I discovered. So I when uh, and this is nothing against North Carolina or the town we moved in, but um, think about it. you're living in New York, mm-hmm. um, up there, you know, probably six years in total. Again, met my wife. Um, we actually got married, got a new job, and moved all within thirty days. I mean, it was Bing, God Bing, Bing, you. right, right. Like, so we God find ourselves you. in North Carolina, yeah, and um, couldn't find a pizza place other than Pizza Hut. 
couldn't find a bagel. Mm -hmm. You know, these were things that were just natural. You'd walk all around New York City. Yeah. And you, so that so you moved to North Carolina in, in, in Winston-Salem, which at that time was a small southern city, very anchored in RJR Tobacco, very anchored in uh, Sara Lee, now mm -hmm. Haynes. Yeah. Um, Other than the university, probably not yeah. too much. And then also, too, when university's out, probably almost like a ghost town in a sense. Well, particularly the downtown, right? The yeah. downtowns at that time. Now, guys like you, you want to live in downtown, downtown Charlotte, downtown. All these downtowns are coming back. I mean, it was ghost town after 5 o'clock in Winston. And, and like I said, the... The, actually, Winston has a wonderful heritage of culture, tremendous heritage of uh, charitable giving, mm -hmm. uh, the orchestra, the symphony, um, the, the money in Winston from all of the corporate philanthropy and benevolence was incredible. So that was wonderful. But there were some other areas of Winston that for a lot of us who were coming down, we were just kind of surprised. It was different. But I will say it was easy. Very easy transition. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think anybody still who comes from the north or maybe the the Midwest and moves down south, it's still an easy transition. Yeah. Um, because now we're we're obviously more of a melting pot, but the lifestyle is much easier. The, whether it's the driving or the cost of living or the friendliness of the people, awesome. Weather. That's a, the weather, yeah, right? The weather. Right. I won't leave that out, right? Growing up Absolutely. in the flat right. lands of Iowa with right. a cold wind oh blowing over those, mm. those fields, still right. chills my bones. Right, right, right. So, so anyways, you move, move down here uh, with your wife, you know, your, yeah. your job, you know, you know, how, how long before... Uh, I, in in your write up that that uh, that Jackie sent me, who helped lend this whole interview, sure, yeah. said that you ended up at, at uh, Lowe's as an executive. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, were there any steps in between yeah, there? Yeah, like, there was a journey. Okay, definitely well, a journey. Take, I'll take tell you the journey. Okay, Please so take me on the journey. so uh, so in 1988, R.J. Reynolds bought Nabisco, and uh, the reason, uh, and that was. That was a big deal. I think at that point in time, that was the largest leverage buyout in corporate America at the time. It was big. Mm -hmm. Multi-billions buying multi-billions. And the idea was to bring together two companies that did a lot of business through similar trade channels. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those trade channels is actually called, or at that time was called, a candy and tobacco jobber. And what that meant was that was a distributor who sold to very small stores that sold tobacco products and candy and snack products. So when RJR bought Nabisco, two divisions of Nabisco, Lifesavers Candy, you probably know Lifesavers, mm -hmm. and Planters Nuts, Candy and Snacks, were moved to North Carolina because the two companies were trying to merge those divisions to basically sell together. I was with Lifesavers. So that brought down multi-hundreds of people to Winston-Salem, and that started that whole journey. So that, for me, was 1988 to 1996, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 96, things were changing in Nabisco, um, and I had an opportunity to move to Coca-Cola. One of the things in my career that I, I thought I think is kind of interesting, and I tell our children this, and I would tell anybody this, you know, I think a lot of times opportunities present themselves not from any professional manner, but from the people you meet, the connections you make, the reputation you have with people you work with. And so most of the job changes I've had have come from somebody calling me saying, I want you to come work with me. Bob's a good guy. I can yeah, trust Bob. We work together, Get right. Ready. Bring Bob over. So a gentleman named Frank Bafulco was uh, head of marketing for Coca-Cola USA. He was forming a new group, which kind of was in my sweet spot, and so I joined Coke USA in 96. We moved to Atlanta. That was my pop back and forth. So we uh -huh. moved to Atlanta, um, lived in Atlanta for about four years, was, was with Coca-Cola. That was awesome mm -hmm. um, because you, you know, you're talking about inquisitiveness and brands. I mean, it becomes a brand. Pretty tough. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. They've got it <laughs> right, down. <laughs> right, exactly right. And, and the amount of knowledge that Coke, and still to today, because some of the folks I, I worked with are still there. But the knowledge that Coca-Cola has of its customers was just awesome. For somebody like me, I was a sponge. You mm -hmm. know? And um, so I stayed there for four years. And then funny story was that my old neighbor in Winston-Salem, Harry Baldwin, had gone to work for Lowe's. He was calling me while I was at Coke. You need to come to Lowe's. They need marketing talent. I'm like, what's a Lowe's? First of all, I'm in Atlanta. That's Home Depot country. Mm-hmm. And so finally, I sent him my resume. 
and I was asked to come up to interview for this vice president marketing job. And next thing you know, I was at Lowe's by 2000. And that is when I had probably my, my longest run. I was there for f 15 years, basically the end of 99 to uh, what about middle of 14. And so I came to Lowe's as a VP of marketing. I led marketing for about a decade. And then I moved into merchandising, which was more of the product area, uh, and then some strategy work as well. Mm -hmm. And then I left Lowe's to come to the Children's Institute. And and what, like I said, executive, making good money, doing yeah. all these things, what brought you to, to the Institute? Yeah, well, so, um, so in 2000, uh, 2008, our family consisted of my wife, Lisa, and I, and we had three children. We had Robbie, our oldest, Haley, our middle, and Matthew, our baby, and they, they basically were, call it, four years apart. They were needing stair steps. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2008, uh, Robbie was a freshman at Carolina, mm -hmm. UNC Chapel Hill. Haley was a junior in high school. Matthew was going to be a sophomore. But Matthew was uh, severely injured playing football. Um, for Reynolds High School as a sophomore, his first football game, um, and he died. He had a traumatic brain injury. He had what's called a subdural hematoma. Um, in his first games playing linebacker, um, he did not see a block coming. It was a blind side block, you know, nothing against the young man, you know. Yeah. Um, but he was unconscious on the field, rushed to Brenner Children's Hospital, uh, brain surgery, coma, and death um, the Sunday early morning after his Friday injury. So in 2008, you know, your life, boom. Yep. Life, in fact, you know, life could have been over, but instead of it being over, it was, okay, now what do we do? And so interestingly enough, the same year that happened, and we formed the Matthew Gefeller Foundation, we formed the Matthew Gefeller Sport-Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center at UNC Chapel Hill, and I can tell you more about that. But as importantly, the Childresses, Richard and Judy, formed the Children's Institute for Pediatric Trauma, and it happened to be founded at Wake Forest University. And, and also kind of interestingly enough, through a similar type situation, but not with a child. So Matthew... Um, um, Richard's best friend for years was Dale Earnhardt Sr., number three, the Intimidator, mm -hmm. awesome, right? I think seven championships, and they were buds, you know, in everything. But when when Dale Earnhardt hit the wall in Daytona, in 01, I think it was, um, uh, he died of a traumatic brain injury. His surgeon was a Dr. Charlie Branch at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. Matthew's surgeon was Dr. Charlie Branch at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. So interestingly enough, when we formed Matt's foundation and the Childresses formed the Childress Institute, we kind of started working together because we're in the same world now. Mm -hmm. And the world that we're in is pediatric trauma, which is severe injury to children that leads usually to hospitalization, surgery, and then recovery. Uh, Matthew didn't recover. Um, thankfully, most children recover. But still in the U.S., um, almost 10,000 children a year die from what's called a traumatic, a traumatic incident. Very small percentage in sports. Large percentage due to automobile accidents. Drowning, slips and falls, burns. Child abuse is part of that. Um, and so if you look at the data and you look at, if you were to ask the question, what's killing children in America? Trauma is the number one killer of children. It's five times the taker of children's lives than cancer is. Another fact we use at the Institute, which is kind of mind-blowing to me, that because you hear about this actually right now, this is flu season. Mm -hmm. For every one child who dies of the flu, which is terrible, 34 children will die of trauma. Another way to look at it, every day about 27 children in our country die of trauma. So kind of what, what moved me from Lowe's to where I am now is we were doing a lot of work with Matt's Foundation, fundraising, awareness, education. The Children's Institute's fantastic organization. They were doing the same. And um, a Dr. Wayne Meredith had been the executive director of the Institute, but he also ran surgery for, for Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem. So he had a huge role. He has a wonderful team. 
I work with three wonderful ladies at the Institute. And so they were looking to bring somebody in who could put more full-time attention to it. And so our daughter was graduating from Chapel Hill. Our son had already gone off. And so it was a perfect opportunity to kind of step more full-time into the world to make an even bigger impact with the team at the Children's Institute. And I think what's really interesting for me is by doing that, what I think we're finding is that the world of pediatric trauma, it's, it's, it's kind of like a small world. Mm-hmm. Um, the specialists in medical practice in pediatric trauma is a very small group compared to the numbers of tens of thousands of doctors you know that there are in the U.S. And so we're working to try to improve the care that children get should they be severely injured and have to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we talk about trauma and you just mm. you, you listen a wide variety of how it happens, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, mostly your institute is, I, I assume, discussing with after the trauma occurs, but is there any, you know, steps and preventative measures sure. that the institute has taken to the prevention sure. of trauma? Sure. And, and actually, that's a great question. I mean, in our, in our mission, um, be, the, we, we, we work in prevention and in care. Mm-hmm. We're not a clinic. So as an institute, our focus is mainly in research, education, and advocacy. And that can include fundraising. Um, in the space of research, we're doing some research that's in prevention. I can give you an example. And then we're doing some, some research that's also in care. The tricky part, I think, with pediatric trauma is when you talk to parents, they're very focused on prevention, which is a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> right? So some are overly, some, some are like, let right? them dust it off. Right, exactly. But know? they don't want their kid to get hurt. Obviously. What we're trying to do is maybe kind of balance their knowledge because if their child is hurt, they kind of need to know what to do. Maybe where they should go, the questions they should ask. And I think, and I, I'm, I'm going to use Bob, me, as my as a primary example, you know, I think that we take, to some degree, we take our, our trauma system for granted because we think, Matthew's a good example, he's knocked out on the field. Well, he's going to get the best care. They're going to know exactly what to do. He's going to be transported to the hospital quickly. He's going to have great care. He's going to be fine. Yeah, that, well, that's logically what you think. Right, but 10,000 times a year, that doesn't happen. Now, that's nobody's fault, but the Institute sees the opening to try to help raise the level of care nationwide. And I'll, and I'll kind of paint a picture for you, and this may help your audience as well. If you had a map of the U.S. in front of you, mm-hmm. and you said, hey, let's plot all the hospitals, you'd plot about 6,000 hospitals. That's a lot of hospitals. Our state alone has 128 hospitals, North Carolina, give or take. Okay, now you'd say, okay, those are all the hospitals of all different levels, sizes. Now let's plot the, the adult trauma centers. Okay, that, that are focused and, and, quote, I would call it accredited to handle adult trauma. You'd pull out about 900 of those out of the 6,000. That's not bad. Then you'd say, well, now let's pull out the top-level pediatric trauma hospitals. You'd pull out like 40 of them. You add another 40 that are the next level down, and you have less than 100 of those 6,000 hospitals are pediatric trauma hospitals, whether they're state accredited or accredited by what's called the American College of Surgeons. And the reason why I kind of paint that is because if you looked at the map, what you would find is there are certain states that have a very, what I'd call, ready trauma system. There are other states that don't. And I'm a layman. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. So I'm looking at this from a business standpoint. Our team is saying, wow, there are certain parts of the country that if your child is injured, you might be a little bit off the grid. And I remember Dr. Meredith said to me after Matthew died, and Dr. Meredith is head of surgery at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. He said, Bob, you know, it really matters where your child's injured in this country. Because if your child's injured in a state that's not ready, you think the odds are low of survival. They're like really low. If you look at our state, 128 hospitals, we have three high-level, one or two, pediatric trauma hospitals, Raleigh, Winston-Salem, Brenner Children's Hospitals, and Charlotte. That's pretty good when you look and profile a lot of the other states. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I might have lost my train of thought on that because I kind of get into that map thing. Um, but it just shows you what the, what the readiness of the system is and why we're spending a lot of time at the Children's Institute trying to help those other thousands of hospitals be more ready to serve when a child shows up on their doorstep in, a, in an ambulance who's severely injured. And the number one thing that a non-pediatric trauma hospital should do if there is a severe injury is what they call package and transport that child to a trauma hospital. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Um, and so like the example I've, uh, we've used in talk, talking to Richard, uh, Richard Childers, you know, he's a great outdoorsman. He loves the outdoors. Well, he's hunting in Montana and Idaho and, you know, God forbid there's a there's a an ATV accident or Absolutely. a firearms I, accident. I grew up in a rural community. There you go, right. Exactly. I grew up in a town of 82 people. There you go. Nearest hospital, 35 minute drive. Right. There you, you go. You know, if I if anything happened to me, yeah. like I remember I broke my arm. Right. I had to wait for my father to come out of the field in a tractor. There you go. To take me to a hospital right. that was 45 minutes right. away. See, so you're you're a living example of 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 one of the things that we're trying to address, which is, and the medical practitioners or the medical professionals, they call this idea the golden hour. So when a child is injured, in that first hour, it's so important to address that child, get to them, transport them to the right hospital. If you get them to a trauma center, the child has a 25% greater chance of survival. Well, that's pretty good. If you don't, then you've got them at a hospital that's a non-trauma center, and you've got to make sure that, that that group is schooled up to know what to do. And we at the, at the Children's Institute, we've actually mapped the country. So we map the hospitals, and then we map the population. And it's kind of cool to look at this stuff. So you've got a population of 300 million in the U.S., give or take. There's 75 million children under 18 in the U.S. But of those 75 million, about 18 million of them, like you, live in an area that they can't be transported within an hour by ground or air to a trauma center. So we kind of call them off the grid. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the system of trauma and you say, are we ready? Well, we're not as ready as we could be because we got holes. And uh, that's one of the big areas that we're trying to tackle through some new ideas, an educational platform. In other words, bringing virtual education out into the rural areas. Uh, bringing care out into the more rural areas. I mean, these are all huge opportunities that will take lots of coalitions and resources to kind of get it done. And for, for someone like me who's been in business to move into this and to really live it and work it every day, it's just fascinating. It's a whole other world. You're still asking those questions, why? Yeah, and I'm saying you're, st you're still doing that. You still, you still have to have a sense of curiosity and how have we can to. make this have better to. for this. Yeah. But it seems like it, it, the stakes are much higher. Yes. Like much higher. Right, it's not a can of soup. Yeah. Right. If, if Progresso puts the wrong label right, on it. Right, right. Or if like they're the wrong colors in their, in their marketing. And you is, know, it's kind of interesting you say that too. Is, is it's um, because we, at the Institute, at the Children's Institute, when we look at what's called the continuum of care, this is what, what medical professionals call it, there's this continuum of care. And again, it's kind of a sketch in your head. So you start to your point with prevention. You don't want it to happen. Yeah. Well, let's say it happens. Well, then you've got this golden hour to address the child, transport them to the right hospital, address them in the emergency department, determine if they need surgery. If they do have to have surgery, then they have to have care in the hospital. Then they might have to move to rehabilitation. Then they try to get back to life. But, but, I mean, this is, you know, this long journey, to your point. It's just a very and you're hoping long journey. That, and, and you're hoping and expecting to get the best possible care, which Bingo. may not always exist. Exactly right. And and I think for the Children's Institute and a lot of organizations, you got to pick you got to pick your spots. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to focus on that golden hour of care. Is the paramedic as ready as he or she can be when he sh when when he or she shows up at your fall in the field in in the cornfield? Mm -hmm. You know, or you could focus on this whole notion of return to life, which is um, pediatric neuropsychologists, uh, school psychologists. Can the child concentrate in class? If the child recovers and is handicapped and they're wheel wheelchair bound, what does the school have to do to address that child in the class? I mean, huge. And I, we've seen all kinds of numbers on this. I'm not really sure what the right number is because the span is so huge. Mm -hmm. But the economic impact of 
pediatric trauma across the lifetime of learning and living capability is like a hundred billion dollars. It's almost 500 billion when you look at adults and you put them in the mix. But the numbers are enormous. So you want to make sure the child, you know, again, God willing that he or she lives, can be as productive as possible in their life. And it all starts with, is the system ready? Can the child be addressed quickly? I hope I didn't digress too much. No, no. And it, <laughs> it, it definitely, it, it, it hits, you know, uh, obviously we were talking about, about children and pediatric yeah. trauma, but it, it, it hits for me because I spent a lot of time wrestling in very yeah. rural parts of Southwest Virginia, coal mining country, wow. West Virginia, wow. and yeah. even like rural parts of North Carolina. And it's a sense of something happens to me, right? you know, and, and, and things happen often than not. They usually don't have a paramedic on hand, and then I have to wait for somebody to get there. Then they have to transport me someplace else, and those are very scary thoughts. And and if particularly now, wrestling, I mean, because wow, now I see why my yeah. mom probably didn't want to watch me wrestle. Yeah, and it's probably definitely. now I see why my grandma said she wouldn't walk across the street to watch me wrestle because <laughs> it seems far more yeah. uh, stressful than than Absolutely. I probably thought until till right about now. Well, you know, one other thing to your point, you were asking. Um, I guess how things evolve, you know, and you, and you talk about, so you're out there wrestling mm -hmm. and you're wrestling in these areas and you don't see a paramedic. You might not have a trainer, you know, since Matthew passed away in 2008, so much has changed. Now it's probably more for your, the high school kids, maybe not the middle school kids, mm -hmm. but w what's happening now is that um, each of the states now in the country have these concussion laws. And all 50 states now have a state concussion law. And actually, the law in North Carolina is named after Matthew and another young man, Jaquan Waller, who passed away just a few weeks after Matt from what's called a second impact syndrome injury, which is a second brain injury, most likely because he was cleared to play too quickly mm -hmm. and he came back in. So it's called the Gefeller-Waller law. But the reason why I bring it up is because, you know, again, you're out there, you're off the grid, you're wrestling. You have a severe injury. Who's the first responder? The coach? The doctor who's in the audience? Me. Mm, you know, yeah. not exactly ideal. Well, a lot of these state laws now are requiring mandatory concussion kind of school for parents and players before they sign up to play a high school sport. They're mandating what's called an emergency action plan, which is that if an injury like Matthews happens where he is knocked out cold, his pupils are huge, there is something really wrong here, there's a plan that springs into play. And the schools are now required to have the plan, rehearse the plan. Um, another thing is athletic trainers. You know, athletic trainers are not mandated at the high school level. The latest data published by the National Athletic Trainers Association says that about 60% of high schools have access to a trainer. So flip that around. That means 40% of our high schools don't necessarily have a trainer employed enough to be at practice and at the games. So we got work to do. But for the other 60%, at least you've got somebody at practice at games who knows what to do. And probably the number one primary thing they do is tell the coach to go away. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got this handled. Let's not move the child. Let's get the backboard. Don't let the parents crowd. Don't let the players crowd. Mm -hmm. Because the trainer is so, so very important, uh, you know, to have in case something was to happen. Um, so, again, I probably went off on that. But when I hear about, you know, you doing that kind of stuff in a remote area – where you're looking around thinking, boy, if there's an injury here, who's going to take care of me? What I would say to you is, in preparation for that match, you might want to talk to the organizer and, and ask, again, be inquisitive. Ask the questions. Are you going to have a trainer available? Is, how close is the ambulance if somebody gets you know, severely hurt? Because I can tell you from what happened to Matt, um, again, no fault of anybody, no lawsuit, no suing anybody. Mm -hmm. But he was on the field 45 minutes. He couldn't breathe. They couldn't clear his ear, his airway. An ambulance had to come, I think, from a county away. And so it w we weren't ready. Now, yeah. his injury was so bad that I don't think Matt really had a chance to survive based on post-op discussions with the doctors and all. But you don't want to be in that position. So that, that's what I tell people when they ask, well, what would you do differently? I'd ask a lot more questions. On the readiness side, to your point, on the prevention side, 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and a lot of states that I wrestle in, they, they have athletic commissions where you have to pay yep. a fee and all these things. But like, what do you get with those fees? Like you don't see, I don't have a problem paying a fee or doing anything or promoters paying fees like in New York, New York, they have to have a doctor on staff. Okay. They have to have, you know, medical personnel there. Uh, Maryland, they're very strict. Everybody gets a physical before they get in the ring. Wow. They have a, a, a doctor there ready, available. Uh, Pennsylvania is very much like that. But South Carolina, where people are required to have physicals and all kinds of things, nobody is required to have emergency professional on hand. Really? You know what I'm wow. saying? They, they have an organization yeah. that's supposed to be handling this, and they don't. Mm. That's always been my big contention with them is like, what are you really paying for other than you just getting a money grab Good here? Question. Like if you're paying them to do this and you're requiring these promoters to pay this, why don't you require them to have emergency, you know, technicians on hand? Yeah. Why, you know, what, what are you trying to, re- you're really not regulating anything. Yeah. You're, 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 ha- you're, you're shuffling paperwork and you're collecting money. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where, like I said, in New York, there are certain papers right. you have to fill. Kansas City, you have to have, you know, AIDS and HIV, uh, hepatitis sure, tests, the, you know, yeah. and same thing in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And you have to have that test twice a year in Louisiana. Wow. Yeah, you know, there's some states that handle things pretty well, and there's yeah. certain states that require, you know, yeah. you know, medical personnel to be on hand. And then, you know, we were talk about football, I think about, because I actually suffered uh, a stinger. In a re- in a football practice, as in, sp- yeah, spine. And I I remember toughing out, which I shouldn't have done. Looking back on it, uh, but I was sure. yeah. This is what you do. That's what you do, right? But I remember in high school there was always an ambulance on hand. There was always technicians mm. there. That's Our great. doctor was always in the, in the stands. The local doctor was there. But I think those things were those steps were taken because of our rural area mm, mm-hmm. is that we have to have this ambulance right there in the right. field. The get, yeah, we yeah. have to, we have That's to, good. we have to take them. That's very good. You know, we either take them to the doctor's office or we're taking them to Makokota or we're taking them to Clinton. Right. right. You know, we more than likely go to Clinton because better, yeah. better hospital. Yeah. But like, yeah. I remember going through the process of dealing with, with a, a nerve injury mm. and some of the doctors I felt on the, on the, on the back end were not, prepared for that really you know what i'm saying i don't i don't think that they yeah. i was getting the type of care and now i went through a trainer and a physical therapist mm-hmm. but i feel like some of the doctors that were mm-hmm. diagnosing me weren't quite mm-hmm. you know yeah. up to par yeah what would you recommend for somebody like a parent that's like i don't think the doctor that we're getting here like because because in this yeah. situation you like your, your, your child's hurt you're going through an emotions you're trying sure. to deal with this sure you know, and just like I just hope I'm getting the best possible care. Right. What, what would you recommend to somebody who feels like I'm not? Feel, I don't think we're getting the best possible care at this level. Yeah, that's good. You know, well, and that's a great question. And and uh, it's interesting you you going through all that, all those things you just said. It kind of takes me back to uh, one of the doctors that we were having a conversation with, um, who helps us put on an educational program for uh, paramedics. Said to us in a conference when we were planning this he said you know just think about this he said if i'm a doctor for 30 years and five percent of my cases are kit severe injuries to children and 95 percent of my cases are adult cases do you think i'm going to be ready to deal with that kid that shows up on our doorstep of our hospital and obviously he was saying no i'm not and so i need this kind of education i need this kind of help so it kind of brings me to you know the situation that you were talking about questions to ask about the doctors who are caring for you now you know there's so much information now on the internet Mm -hmm. about doctors and their reputations and doctors are ranked five star and in fact you see the best doctors in the u.s i mean you actually see ads where they're touting you know their reputation so Mm -hmm. i think in this day and age if a parent has a question about the care that the child is getting I would probably go do a little bit more homework to try to find out, well, where is this doctor spending their time? What is their reputation? Where did they come from? But if it was me personally, given that what, you know, what's happened to Matt, I would ask a lot of direct questions Mm -hmm. about the care that you might be getting or the lack of it or the concerns that they have. Because when you think about, when you think about the kind of pressure that's on a physician today, just, just, it's like, just step back and just think, okay, I am now walking in their shoes. They are under so much pressure for their licensing, their accreditation, always the risk of a problem on the backside in care, then always a risk of potential retribution on the backside. 
you know, they are trying so hard to do the best that they can that I think the parent would do them a great service to make sure that they're explaining to the parent the type of skills and experience that they bring to the party because they don't want to make a mistake. Yeah. They don't want to do something wrong. They're, just, they're almost along for the ride in the sense that they, it's like, I hope I'm getting, like, I'm just more wrapped up in my child is hurt. Correct. Correct. And I think to your point, so, you know, for the parent to step back. Yeah. Think about the kind of, what would you call, anxiety the doctor might be going through and try to create that relationship to get the answers that you're looking for. Um, when Matthew was injured and he was at uh, Brenner Children's Hospital, Dr. Branch did the surgery. He was with us all the time. And then there was another doctor there uh, who's still there, and his name's Dr. John Petty. And he runs the trauma center for the Brenner Children's Hospital in Winston-Salem. And I, I tell you this because in a situation like Matthew's, Charlie, Dr. Branch, Charlie Branch, he was the neurosurgeon. He had done the surgery. He was, he was inside seeing what was going on. But Dr. Petty played a different role. Dr. Petty's role was calm the parents, calm the hundreds of people that were in the waiting room, Make sure the parents are very clear on what Dr. Branch is telling him, them. Mm -hmm. The family is clear. So it's kind of interesting. He played a different role for us that was kind of the stabilizer, the equalizer, the nurturer. And he still plays that role today. Um, so in a situation of a severe injury, my hunch would be for a parent, there are going to be multiple touch points with physicians. You know, you're going to gravitate to the physician that you might be most comfortable with, but you got to make sure the one you're uncomfortable with, maybe another physician can help you with. Mm -hmm. So I just remember all this dynamic happening in that very short period of time. It yeah. was like 48 hours. Um, but it goes back to, I think, being strong enough to be clear-headed enough to ask those right questions, or at least to ask for multiple opinions, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Matthew's injury was sustained on a football field, mm. and that is something that's been discussed a lot, with, especially the concussions and, yeah. and the way people are taught how right. to play football. Um, have you seen or any research of, like, you know, because my uncle works for NFL Films, and he does a lot. Oh, he wow. said one of the more fulfilling pieces he did is these seminars in these clinics mm -hmm. discussing – to coaches, this is the way you properly teach kids how to tackle, how yeah. to block, yeah. how to do this to help prevention. You know, Absolutely. is there is there anything that you know your institute is even yes. as far as like sports related injuries yes. and seminars to teach people like, hey, this is probably how you do things and everything else. Absolutely, and, yeah. And I, thanks for the opening to talk yeah. about that. Um, so at the Children's Institute, we really focus in two areas. One is that whole first area we were talking about, raising the level of care, filling the holes, trying to help the system be more ready across the country. But the other area that we work in is prevention and care in recreation and sports. <clears throat> and we call it recreation and sports because you can't separate the two. Yeah. Um, so when you, if, if we want to talk a little bit about football, maybe we kind of just start there. Uh, for now, because as you said, it's in the news. It's been in the news for years now, um, and it 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 um, it has to start at the top. So to your point, your your uncles with NFL films, you got to give the NFL a lot of credit. They're under a lot of fire, but you got to give them a lot of credit because Roger Goodell has inherited a, a serious issue. He is trying to address the issue, whether it's the way he's changed the committees, the personnel, whatever. But he is moving to do his best as the, the head of the NFL to make football safer. Mm -hmm. Now, can it ever be fully safe? Absolutely not. Okay. But he's trying to make it safer. So the <clears throat> Heads Up Football clinic program that they have put together, sponsored, created ambassadors around the country, the Children's Institute and the Macafeller Center have locked into that. Because it, ta it kind of takes a tribe. It takes a tribe to reach the youth. And I'll, I'll just, again, some more numbers for you. When you look at football, round numbers, 5 million football players in the U.S., 2,000 in the NFL, a million five in high school, 3.5 million below high school. 
For every NFL football player, there are 2,000 players playing at the youth level. So there are a lot of little kids running around playing football that need, to your point, that need to be taught the right blocking and tackling techniques. And that's what the heads-up clinics are about. Mm -hmm. So the Children's Institute, the Matt Gefeller Foundation, we've partnered with a company called Kids and Pros, which is run by Buddy Curry. Buddy played for University of North Carolina, played for the Atlanta Falcons. He is a heads-up football ambassador. And what that means is, is that his company is endorsed to execute these programs. So we kind of come together with youth football. We have done that here in Lexington, uh, North Carolina, with the Arcadia football community. We've done that in Davie County with the Davie County football community, Forsyth County with the Forsyth County football community. And we've put on uh, clinics that are focused on the players, the coaches. We've even done clinics with the parents. Um, one of the big trends of the Heads Up uh, programs now are the moms. They actually put on programs just for the moms to go through the same blocking and tackling drills that their boys do so they can understand what they should be looking for. Something doesn't look right. He gets up slower. And then the other thing that's really important in these clinics is that they teach proper helmet fitting and proper shoulder pad fitting. Because at the youth level, you don't have a high school athletic trainer helping you do that. Certainly not at the college, le at the college level you do. But at youth, you have a lot of what's called American Youth Football or Pop Warner Football. And of the 3.5 million kids playing football below the age of high school, only I think about 60% are organized leagues in, in one of those two. So the parents need to know a lot of information to make sure – the kids getting on the field as ready, equipment, technique, talent, you know, that they can when they go out there. And so um, Jeff Miller, great guy, he runs safety for the NFL. That works for Roger Goodell. We've met with him a number of times. Again, there's a small group of people working on all this. But what he's seeing in the research, and actually they published, the NFL published a recent study over the summer is that they are seeing the incidence of concussion dropping um, as they're trying to measure, quantitatively measure, the impact of, their, of, the, of the whole heads-up program nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when, when, I, when I talk to people about, you know, what are you seeing? Well, I think we're seeing better prevention, better equipment, better coaching of technique. We are seeing better results. We're seeing endorsement and sponsorship by the NFL. So I think when you sum it all up, you're seeing a culture change. But that culture change is going to take a long time, yeah. right? And uh, I tell people, in fact, it will be probably your grandchildren who truly see the full impact of that. And that, that, that's how long it's going to take. There's that many people to touch and touch and touch and touch. Yeah, you got to get everybody. Right. That, you know, the kids got to grow up and then go through the system. You they become it. NFL players. And, then, of course, right. they become coaches. They have to teach right. the same techniques. they so got to walk the walk, talk the talk. And then teach it all the way right. through. And we've been to many clinics, ones that we've funded and sponsored, ones that we've observed. And you can tell, you can tell who's in and you can tell who's not. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not always unanimous. And that's why it's going to take a lot, as you just said, a lot of cycling to really believe in it and buy in it. And then you got to look at all the other sports, which if you want, I can talk to you a little bit about those because that's just football. Yeah, because football is the most contact. Yeah, but, I mean, right. there, there are all sorts of injuries that occur sure. with, with basketball. Sure, and, exactly And right. even baseball, like you look even at recent, baseball, right? just recently the, the Mets with the <clears throat> sliding and yep. stuff like that. That's become an issue. So, yeah, I mean, you could <laughs> paint this huge mosaic. So when you kind of look at youth, so this is – basically high school and below, and you look at boys, you have football, but then you have hockey. Think about that. You're skating around. The boards don't move. Mm -hmm. You have soccer. You have lacrosse, fastest growing sport in the country, girls and boys. And then when you look at girls, you have soccer, number one, basketball, number two, to your point, basketball. Who'd think basketball? But when girls are playing basketball and they're going up for rebounds, they're hitting head to head. They're hitting head to arm. They're hitting head to floor. I, I always say that right. a basketball player probably would benefit from day one of uh, wrestling training so they learn how to take a fall properly. There you go. Because it's scary. There you go. Good yeah, I've point. seen guys fall and they put their, their wrists right. down and snap. immediately you snap them. Yeah. It's just, it, you're almost better taking it blow with your entire right. back. Right, right. Try to lay put, flat. Exactly. So. And, you know, wrestling, um, 
I, I see in the data more spinal injuries than necessarily head injuries in wrestling. But So to talk about the youth sports, one of the areas that the Children's Institute we're trying to focus more on is soccer because there are far more youth soccer players in the country than football. Mm-hmm. And, and, and girls outnumber boys. So girls are playing soccer. They're heading the ball. They're hitting each other. They're hitting the ground. And so what's happening in soccer is you don't – there's not a lot of data on concussion. Most of the concussion data is – is happening in football. There are some studies geographically that are collecting more than just football. Um, but in order to determine if there need to be rule changes in soccer, um, like there have been in football, there are practice changes in football, kickoff changes in football, um, you've got to have data. And there's just not a lot of data out there. So our next, our next goal uh, on projects we're working on is studying youth soccer. Um, and you probably have read about, again, in wrestling, you've probably read about some of the non-helmeted um, concussion monitoring systems that are out, mouthpieces, earpieces, headbands, the soft helmet you've seen some of the football teams putting on their helmets. Well, those are all good ideas, but the issue is there's no data. You don't know if they help or not. There's too much noise in the data, and particularly, again, youth. So what we're trying to do is take the next highest sport across girls and boys, soccer, and try to work with Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and their partnership with Virginia Tech. These guys are called biomedical engineers, completely out of my league, Mm -hmm. Um, and study over hundreds of kids and hundreds of contacts. If you wear a mouthpiece that can register a concussion, if, if you wear an earpiece, if you wear a headband, are you measuring a concussion or are you measuring noise? Is the data good? Is it not? And so I'll give you an analogous example. Um, Dr. Joel Stitzel at Wake Forest and his team partnered with a, a gentleman named Dr. Stefan Duma and, and Steve Rousen at Virginia Tech. They've been studying youth football for four years, I think, now. And they're going to study it for another five years, so almost 10 years of research. The Children's Institute help fund that. The Macafeller Foundation helped fund that. The NIH has now come through with a big dollar grant to help fund that. And what they're trying to figure out in, in just one sport, youth, is if I let my child play football from age, call it 8 to 18, and they stick with that sport all those years, what's happened to the development of their brain? Not from a concussive hit, but from all of the Little things. You got it. All those little, thousands little car accidents thousands. that happen. Right, exactly. Well, we don't know that. Now they're starting to see data. Things are coming together. Kids are staying in the study year over. But you got to get such a big sample size that it's going to take that long to hopefully have directional information. And, again, that's just studying boys in football. So imagine soccer. <laughs> imagine hockey. Imagine lacrosse. You know, a couple of things that I find fascinating because of, you know, having played lacrosse, girls lacrosse, they don't wear helmets, but yet there's a move afoot that maybe they should. Girls field hockey only started wearing eye protection, I don't know, a decade ago. If you ever watch field hockey, you got to stick in the ball and everybody's leaning over. Um, You know, so so there are some things that the governing bodies are now starting to take a look at because they're seeing high school data and they're saying, wow, maybe we need to make a call. The NCAA... The, uh, the chief medical officer for the NCAA is Dr. Brian Hanlon, uh, and he's a great guy, and he works all on collaboration. So he's brought together a collaborative uh, set of, of universities um, to begin addressing at the NCAA level all the varsity sports. So it's called the Grand Alliance. The Department of Defense is involved. The NCAA is involved. They put $30 million in a pot and they're going to study concussive injury across all college varsity sports, boys and girls, over the next probably 20 years. Because what he's, Dr. Hanlon is saying, he's a neurologist by trade, by trade, by training. What he's saying is that we, the NCAA, we got to set the tone across all these sports, not just football with the NFL, but across all of them, because it all trickles down in high school, it all trickles down. So you'll start to see if you go out on the internet and look at the NCAA guidelines that have been published for, for football in particular. You know, they're publishing guidelines on return to play. They're publishing guidelines on the type of techniques that should be used at practice. They're publishing guidelines on the number of days where full pads and two-a-days should be used. 
all trying to, as your point before, change that culture and move it forward. So all that's got to trickle down into youth, which will take, again, back to the Children's Institute, a lot of time and a lot of funding. And it won't just be governmental funding because if you look at NIH funding over the last 20 years, it's flat. So if you add inflation to it, it's down in real dollars. So it comes from great philanthropists like the Childresses, all the great donors we have that give us money. I don't care if it's five bucks. It's moving kind of the amoeba, you know, in the, in the right direction. Absolutely, and, yeah. and through education and exactly. everything else. But, you know, you talk about big partners. You talk about the NFL. You talk about the NCAA. You talk about yeah. all these people, and you know, you know. But how, as an individual, just a, just a parent, how can they get involved with the Children's Institute to help push forward your message, sure. make sure the funding's there? Like, what, what can they do to, to benefit your cause? Sure. So I appreciate the question. Um, you know, the Children's Institute is what's called a 501c3 public charity. And if you look at the U.S., there's about a million four of those types of charities. And so what we have is a charity that has been founded and is sustained by this wonderful gift from the Childresses. But in order to go do the work we need to do on the scale that we need to do it, it has to scale up. So people can get involved with us. Number one, visit our website, saveinjuredkids.org, saveinjuredkids.org. That's what we're trying to do, Save Injured Kids. Kara Thompson, who's our marketer, she keeps that thing completely up to date with all the things we're doing and all the things we're learning because what we're trying to do as an institute is pass through that information. So what the website can help uh, people do is just get schooled. Get schooled on recreation, schooled on sports. The whole pediatric trauma system I was talking about. Um, when you come to our website, you can help us do our work. So as an example, if you come to our website, you'll see that we have a fund. It's called the Concussion Care Fund. And what we're saying to people is if you're interested in helping us do our research and educational programs to help in concussion care, donate to that fund. If you want to donate to, to the Institute, just donate to the Institute. So I think coming to the website to learn, coming to the website to 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 give us any amount of your treasure that you think we will take forward and do worthy work with is wonderful. And then the other thing is that um, we do put on fundraising events. So as an example, uh, we do events that bring in potential donors or, or people that have been very generous uh, with the Institute. And on many of those, we can always use volunteers. Right, helping us with registration, helping us with gift bags and things that we do. So if you're interested in helping us with any of our events, which are on the website, go to our photo gallery as an example, and you'll, you'll see the types of things that we do. Um, send us an email. And uh, if you're local and you want to participate or if we do things in other states, that would be great too. Uh, so, And then the last thing I would say to you is that there, are, there is information on our website that you can download, print, use. And my, my favorite example is... Um, on the website is, a, is a, a little concussion fact sheet, signs and symptoms of concussion, what to look for as a parent. And uh, that thing's been downloaded and printed hundreds of times. People are really sticking it on their refrigerator because it has very basic things, you know, for a parent to look at that they might be able to utilize with their child. Those types of tools, we want to provide more of those tools <clears throat> to, other, uh, to address other issues that we're trying to tackle. <clears throat> And then the last thing I would say is that, you know, there are other organizations out there with a lot of good information. The CDC um, has Center for Disease Control, has, has great information. The NATA, National Athletic Trainers Association, great information for parents. Um, and then a new friend with, that we're starting to, to figure out how to work with is the CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So as an example... Uh, we do a lot of work in recreational safety, ATV safety. So wear the helmet, ride the, ride the machine that's right for your size. Uh, don't ride two kids together on an ATV. Don't ride on a paved road. They're not built for a paved road. The, those tires are usually going to bounce around and flip you. Mm -hmm. Well, the CPSC does a lot of really good work in, in ATV safety. And we do that because Richard, again, is such a passionate outdoorsman, uh, as are Austin and Ty. Those are his two grandsons. They're his drivers. They love the outdoors. Ty just got married to, to Haley. Um, and so that's another area that we provide a lot of really good information on the website. In fact, um, if you're an ATVer in your audience, come to our website 
and uh, you can click on our ATV safety video. A couple minutes. It's uh, emceed by Austin and Ty. It's really good fundamental information on, on be smart. And the tagline is uh, think, ride, live. So think before you get on it, ride it safely, and live safely. Well, Bob, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. You've been very gracious. Is Great, there anything that you. we've glazed over that you want to let people know or, or anything else you want to share with us? Well, I will tell you uh, two events that are coming up, if hey, I please. could. It's a little Absolute, bit of a PSA. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, but we're very excited that on November 3rd uh, at High Point University in the basketball arena, and High Point University has been very, very gracious and generous to us, we're actually holding a really unique and interesting fundraiser. It's called the Austin Dillon Celebrity 3-on-3 Basketball Tournament. And it's sponsored and presented by Dow, uh, which is one of Austin's primary sponsors. And the proceeds come to the Children's Institute. And it was an idea that Austin and Ty hatched for us, um, well, I guess, last winter. Because they've always wanted to have their buddies play in a celebrity basketball tournament. So if you remember Hoop It Up years ago, mm-hmm. um, this is Hoop It Up done our way. Okay. Uh, the event's from 3 to 8. There are 16 teams. The celebrities come from country music, rodeo, NFL, obviously NASCAR. Um, and it should be a lot of fun. So if you want to come out and have a fun late afternoon, evening, November 3rd, 3 to 8, uh, High Point University basketball and uh, just enjoy the festivities. Lots of autograph time. Great food. Should be a lot of fun. Not sure how ba- how the basketball is going to be, <laughs> <laughs> but we're we're hearing a lot of uh, 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 chatting between the celebrities. And then the other event I thought I'd tell you about is in honor of our son Matthew. We're running the seventh annual Matthew Gefeller Memorial Donut Run. That's in Winston Salem at R.J. Reynolds High School. The morning of November 14th is at 9 a.m. All the proceeds of that event are split between Matthews Research Center in Chapel Hill and the Childress Institute um, at Wake Forest. And last year we split $50,000. And to put that in perspective for you, $50,000 or $25,000 for the Childress Institute can help sponsor a PhD for an entire year to work on a lot of this great research we're doing. Okay. Well, Bob, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you have to get out of here very quickly, but thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you very much. Thank you.